Hello, good afternoon. Welcome to Midday Live, coming to you live from Adesawe, Kanda. I am Wendy Lai. Top of the bulletin this hour. Thirty-two murder suspects in the killing of Major Mahama back in court. President Ekofado set to turn the valves on FPSO John Kufu for formal commercial production at Sankofa Jinami Oil and Gas Field. Pressure group Occupy Ghana says BNI's investigation of BOST is deficient, calling for reinvestigation on the matter. Details coming up shortly. Peace is good. We now start with our stories and the chiefs of Nkonya and Alavanyo have told the Volta Regional House of Chiefs that the atrocities in the area is no longer related to the historical land dispute. According to the chiefs, what is happening currently is purely criminal and lawlessness that must be investigated and dealt with. These came up and came up to light during the first med mediation meeting at the instance of the Regional House of Chiefs in Ho. Despite several efforts and initiatives, the Nkonya Alavanyo communal conflict continues to cut short the lives of innocent persons from the two traditional areas. Six lives were again lost between April and May this year with no arrests made. On Wednesday, the Volta Regional House of Chiefs held a dialogue with the leadership of the two communities at Hull. The meeting sought to identify causes of the conflict with aims of brokering lasting peace. The deliberations today came out clearly that yes, they are aware and they've all admitted that the issue is not a matter of land. The issue of land had already been resolved a long time ago. So the old age history and land issue was resolved as far back as 1980. The current issues, it's a matter, as I said, is about lawlessness. And hopefully and luckily for us, since both of them have admitted that this is the issue, we've agreed and we've expanded them that they should go back, call their members, call their, chair, their citizens into order, and until we meet again, we take up the up. It's a very fruitful meeting, and then I like the way the regional house of chief took the step and he want to resolve this issue. We are talking to our youth that conflict is not good, and this is the outcome of the conflict. Therefore, we need to stop this nonsense and continue and live in peace and harmony. Both sides have agreed that the land dispute has been settled way back in 1980. And so as far as I'm concerned today, the Nkonya and Alavanyo don't have any land dispute. The land belongs to Nkonya people. And so recent occurrences is just criminal activities. And so they have tasked us to go back to our various communities to make sure and then fish out those engaged in these criminal activities because there are certain people who are interested and are gaining from these criminal activities. And I'm going to do that. Well, as far as I'm concerned, anything that is hidden should be brought out. As soon as I get wind of it, I will expose it. I will expose it. Because what is happening is affecting me personally. Most of the people dying are my subjects, my children. They have been killed. So anything I feel I have, which I can say to have this solved, I will, I will, I will do so. So I will cooperate always.
In other news, members of the University Teachers Association of Ghana have threatened to withdraw their services next week if governments does not settle their book and research allowance. National President Dr. Harry Agbanu is of the view the delay in the payment has affected academic work on the various campuses across the country. The point is that members are becoming impatient and they have given us up to the, next of, uh, uh, the end of next week for the money to be paid, after which, uh, as leaders, we may not be able to control what they will do next. My checks are telling me that the documents are lying on the table of the finance minister, mm -hmm. who is supposed to give the final approval for the final authorization to uh, control an accountant general to process the money to be paid. But for some reason, he appears not interested or not in a hurry to process the document, to give the final approval. So that is what is holding back the payment of the book and research allowances. After one of our headline stories, and 32 suspects are alleged to have actively taken part in the murder of Major Maxwell Mahama back in court, that's the Accra District Court today, and the suspects are standing trial on the charges of murder and conspiracy to murder. Please have produced evidence on the supposed 12-year-old Bernard Asamoah, being 22 years of age, who completed his BC in April 2015, a document produced by the police after investigators visited Dinsha Bwasi showed his age on the spreadsheet obtained from the district education office was at the time he sat for the exams was 19. Yes, this evidence was corroborated by his father, Bismarck Asamwa. Prosecutors have told the court he lied about his age as a ploy to seek sympathy from the court. So we now go to the phone lines and speak to my colleague, Komla Kluche, who's been following this very issue in court. Hello, Komla. I think we've lost him on the phone lines, but we're trying uh, that again to see if we can reach him. And the story is that the 32 suspects are alleged to have actively taken part in the murder of Major Maxwell Mahama are back in court, and that's their Accra district courts. The suspects are standing trial on the charges of murder and conspiracy to murder. Please have produced evidence on the supposed 12-year-old Bernard Asamoa, who is 22 years of age and completed his BC in April 2015. A document produced by the police after investigators visited in Chobwasi showed his age on the spreadsheets obtained from the district education office as at that time he sat for the exams he was 19 years and i'm told i do have kumla kluche back on the phone lines hello kumla hi now can you give us an update on what exactly happened in court today okay so what what um happened was that you know at the last issue the given an order can you speak uh, up kumla uh, Wendy, can mm. you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. Uh, at the last agenda, the, the magistrate court had issued uh, some instructions to the police and the prosecution that the 12-year-old boy, that uh, Bernard Asamwahi, then he gave his age of 12 years, but later uh, the court had identified that he was 17 years, that he should be sent to the bus home because he, he, was, he was still not up to uh, the 18 years and all of which he can stand uh, trial in the murder case. But mm -hmm. the police have gone further to establish that he actually lied to the court when he said he was 12 years, mm -hmm. and the court again giving him 17 years. The police sent investigators, uh, uh, sent investigators to the Denshawas area to specifically his, his basic school that he had attended and he completed in 2015. Now, from the spreadsheet that he had obtained from the school and again uh, verified from the district education office, uh, it indicated at the time that he, he was he was 19 years mm. when uh, he sat for the exam. Now, and and uh, the exams were held in April 2015. Uh, prosecutors took that he only sought to lie to the court to seek sympathy and then enjoy the benefit of the juvenile that uh, 
he was simply trying to throw that into the eyes of the court. Mm -hmm. This was also asked uh, the father, who is also part of the people who have been arrested, who who is in the name of Bismarck Asamoah. The boy's name is Bernard Asamoah. The father is Bismarck. Bismarck corroborated in open court that yes, uh, his son is, is 22 years and had completed uh, junior high. That that uh, his B.C. in 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 2015. Mm. So All right. the judge, uh, the judge had indicated that well, he could be at it should be added to the number of people who are the suspects who are standing trial. But as I speak with you, when the the, the court has charged uh, William Barr, the assemblyman, and then 18 others for conspiracy mm. to murder and then murder, they were released at the other time because there was no ample evidence against them. Mm. They were released and then they were rearrested again and then brought before the court and the charge has been leveled against them for murder. Uh, conspiracy to murder of mm. Maxwell Muhammad. All right, Kamala, last time the number of people who stormed the court is that the same today? Uh, yeah, there are a good number of people here. Not, not, not much, though, but a handful of them or who are here. Mm. Uh, I, I mean, sensibly taking pictures of them. But what the police have done this time around is, 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 is to caution them again, uh, telling insults at them, uh, calling them names, and all that. The security presence at the court still heavy. Mm. You know that uh, so, uh, 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 apart from the two vans in which they, they came in, there were about four other uh, cars with heavily uh, heavily armed um, policemen who are guarding them and are still here at the court. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kamala Kluche. He is my colleague following the major Maxwell Mahama case in court. Well, he bring us some more updates as and when he gets them. But let's move on to another story which has to do with President Ekufu Ado, who is set to attend the vows of the FPSO John Kufu today, which is July 6th, for formal commercial production of the Sankofa Genuami Oil and Gas Field. Now, information available to TV3 indicates that production has already started, but the formal ceremony will herald production on the field, and this will aid the production of 45,000 barrels of crude oil in the first phase of production up to 180 million standard cubic feet by the end of the year. So shortly I will be speaking to our presidential reporter who joins me via phone. Hello, Nanadria. Hello, Wendy. Now, what has the president been saying? Well, the president has not spoken yet. Uh, mm. uh, currently, the president is on the offshore rig uh, where he's going to turn uh, the valve. So he's gone. I actually understand it takes about 40 uh, minutes uh, flight to get there. So uh, in the next probably 30 to 45 minutes, the president should be coming from the offshore mm. uh, to address uh, the gathering. So apparently, uh, is there right now uh, turning the valve? So we expected the president to come in. But let me just give you a little background of the, the, the benefits the country would derive from uh, what is happening today. Now the field is starting production uh, three months ahead of the, uh, the schedule. Uh, now the, the project, uh, according to report, could raise Ghana's oil output to around to around 2,000. Uh, barrel or 200,000 barrel, as you said, uh, per day, and uh, gas production uh, more than 30 million uh, standard cubic uh, feet. Mm. So, apparently, we are expecting uh, Ghana to benefit. And uh, in terms of electricity, uh, the Sankofa Dynamics Board could increase electricity by 1,000 megawatts. That's the report we are gathering. So, uh, today's uh, uh, program is so huge that um, Ghana really will, will start commercial. Uh, production in large quantity after the valve has been turned by the president. Well, thank you so much, Nana Kwekwe, dear. He's our presidential reporter, and he'll get back to us um, with some updates on what is happening in the western region. You're still watching Midday Live. Let's look at some more. And rescue workers cannot retrieve bodies of the killed illegal miners at Nsuta Pristia due to the weak nature of the pit. Rescuers have sighted the bodies but are unable to get to where they were trapped. 
For five days, efforts have been stepped up, hoping to rescue those trapped under the pit. Hope, however, faded out after torrential rains impeded rescue efforts. After retrieving one body on Wednesday, the team kept up rescue efforts. But Thursday morning, the team had seen bodies of dead illegal miners trapped under rubble. However, getting to where they are trapped is difficult. Rescuers say the pit is old and has become very weak. One rescuer confirmed 17 dead underground and only one had been retrieved. Their quest to bring out the load was when the incident occurred. Those here struggled to help but did not have the strength to do so. The Deputy Lands and Natural Resources Minister, Benito Owusubio, and the Deputy Western Regional Minister, Gifty Eugenia Kusi, accompanied by Western Regional Police Commander, DCOP Kwesi Mensah Duku, and other members of the Regional Security Council, visited the accident site. They met the members of the rescue team, who said the stench from the pit indicates the beginning of decomposition of the bodies. The Deputy Minister for Lands and Natural Resources, Benito Owusubio, said government will ensure illegal mining is controlled. We will move into the second phase, and that is bringing in the military task force for them to uh, flush out the few hard knots who are still in the system. Going forward, from July 19th, we'll be in Takwa, where we are going to have the first major stakeholders meeting to look at how uh, we are going to tackle the issue with the project that we intend coming out with. 17 illegal miners were trapped in a pit at Pristia Unsuta in the Pristia Huni Valley District of the Western Region last Sunday. The illegal miners in the pit were about 22, but five of them managed to escape unhurt when the pit caved in. The five survivors are currently assisting the police in investigations. Now to health and cases of malaria and typhoid are on the increase in Zulus or a slit community in the Joma district of the western region. Residents dispose of waste and the source of water used for their domestic chores. A team from the U at Heart Foundation was at the community to offer medical assistance. Established in the early 15th century by Malians, Nzulezu has served as a habitat for both humans and aquatic lives. The stilt community has also attracted tourists for decades. In spite of the attraction to tourists all this time, the community has not seen much development. Most of the wooden balls serving as stilts are rotten, risking lives of residents and tourists who patronize the community. Waste generated as a result of domestic activities are dumped into the Amazula River, which also served as a source of drinking water for the residents. Although three waste bins have been placed at vantage locations to aid in maintaining good sanitary conditions in the area, residents still dispose of garbage in the water, claiming they have no dumping sites. A public biofuel latrin also discharges into the river, which is their source of drinking water. However, there is no access to a health facility in the stilt community. Tourists will not attempt drinking from this water source because of its look. But residents see no problem with it. A team from the U at Heart Foundation was in the community to provide health care to the residents. Out of the total of 450 residents screened, 126 of them, including children, were malaria positive. 80 has typhoid, while 20 has blood pressure, but there was no case of bilharzia. Organizer of the U at Heart Foundation, Kunto Nketia, attributed the increase of the diseases in Nzulezu to the environment. We did ask about how they are able to dispose of their fields, and they said um, it's very difficult for them to get rid of it because they are supposed to take it into the bushes, but each time it rains, all these fields come back to the community. President of the foundation, Dr. Jumon Ketia, is of the belief their gesture will yield positive impact on the community. We also found, unfortunately, a lot of the elderly with hypertension. Three months supply of medicine for the inhabitants of Enzulenzo will go a long way to prevent the complication of hypertension. 
Canoes to convey junior high school students to school in nearby community is also a challenge. This canoe belonging to some wildlife officials is what they depend on for their movement to school daily. Their parents cannot afford the canoe. Because our mothers are not having money to buy some of the things for us. We wait time for years. After the speedboat will come, then we drink. When you reach at the school, almost getting to now. Residents say they do not benefit from the tourism revenue in the area. That's another headline story in a press statement from Occupy Ghana issued last night supports the formation of a ministerial committee with an expanded mandate to investigate all sales of alleged contaminated products by Boss. Now, they indicated that they were happy to wait for the results of the ministerial committee that was announced to investigate the matter before making their comments public, but their attention had been drawn to what purports to be the report by the Bureau of National Investigations, BNI, and all alleged reports apparently attempts to absolve some key and critical actors in the matter. So I'm going on the phone line to speak with the leading member of Occupy Ghana, Sidney Kisley Hayford. Good afternoon, sir, and thanks for agreeing to speak with us. Can you hear me? Good afternoon, Sydney. I think we're having some difficulties with our phone lines, but we'll try again and speak to him in a press statement from Occupy Ghana. Uh, indicates that they support the formation of the ministerial committee with um, the expanded mandate to investigate all sales of alleged contaminated products by Boston. They were happy to wait for the results of the ministerial committee that was announced to investigate the matter before making comments um, public. But their attention has been drawn to what purports to be the report by the Bureau of National Investigations, BNI, that all the alleged reports apparently attempts to absolve some key and critical actors in the matter. So I'm going back on the phone line to speak to Sidney Kisley Hayford. He is a leading member of Occupy Ghana. Good afternoon and thanks for your time. Afternoon. Now, can you quickly run us through what you see as deficiencies in the BNI report? We've lost him again on the phone lines. You still watch him in life. Welcome back. We're still watching Media Life. Let's go back to our earlier story regarding the statement released from Occupy Ghana, which supports the formation of ministerial committee with an expanded mandate to investigate all sales of alleged contaminated products by Boston. I'm going back to the phone lines to speak to Sidney Kisleyford. He is a leading member of Occupy Ghana. Good afternoon, sir, and thanks for your time. Sure, afternoon. Now, can you quickly run us through the deficiencies you saw in the BNI report? We, okay, let me correct something. Mm. We are not criticizing the BNI report. Mm. Okay? Uh -huh. The BNI report is the BNI report. There are issues that we expect to have been addressed before the BNI report was made. And we are asking those questions whether the board of directors sanctioned this, whether procurement was actually uh, 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 honored, whether this is a recurring event, and what has been going on with it historically. Mm. Those things are issues that we expect that the committee would investigate and come up with this report. The BNI report should supposed to feed into the committee's report and to carry on. Our problem, our problem is that the committee that was set up, even before it had started its work, has been dissolved and we mm. don't expect that to happen we expect the committee to be fully constituted to do the job according to the terms of reference that it was given mm. that's it now eve i stand to i stand to be corrected in your statement you mentioned that um if i can quickly go through your attention has been drawn in attempts to absolve some key and critical actors in the matter now the 
Boss MD had been cleared of any wrongdoing, do you think that he should still be in office while investigation is ongoing? Well, those are issues that can be discussed in detail. And if you want us to go into it, I don't think that at this stage, when somebody is being suspected of having committed a crime, that he should still be sitting in a position where he can influence the direction of the investigation. Mm. He has to step away, and if not, he has to be forced to step away. And that is the way it's supposed to go. We expected that as the ministerial committee was doing its work, all of those things would be issued and taken care of. Mm. I don't know when the BNI started its investigation. I don't know when they actually decided that they would look into it. And they've already done so before the committee has been engaged. And we think that is very, very wrong and should not be the way it's done. But to answer your question directly, mm. no. He should not be in post whilst the investigation is going on because of the possibility of him being able to influence the direction of the investigation. All right. Well, thank you so much. I have been speaking to Sidney Kisley Hayford. He's a leading member of Occupy Ghana. And we're still staying on this very topic. A lot has gone on regarding the Bost contaminated fuel saga. And let's hear what the public have to say on what do you think. This issue of bust and the sale of contaminated oil seem to be getting complicated by the day. The latest being the BNI report that has cleared bust of any wrongdoing. And the minority in parliament also insisting on a full-scale investigation into the matter, accusing the BNI of covering up for bust. What do you also think? I think the investigation must continue. Uh, that is my opinion. Uh, because without the thorough investigation into the whole situation, we can never come out with uh, the real issue that the Ghanaians are looking up to here. Just some few months ago, the BNI is working for the NDC. But why is it that just within a few this thing, and they are coming out with this issue, they are also, I mean, condemning it. It's politics. You see, when you are criticized, you criticize constructively so that we know how things will I mean, move. Because Ghana now, we have to move forward. You should stop all those things. Me, I feel that BNI is trying to cover the, the MD. So this is, they have to try and go into it. The BNI, they, maybe they get some bribe. They chop bribe. Ghana, you know, we, there's a lot of corruption going on. If you sell a contaminated fuel to fully station, it's a great concern. And looking at what is trending, it looks like from the S2 Mama administration, uh, the sale of contaminated fuel is not the first time that existed before. But we don't know what has gone on, and I would want to say something that I'm not, I don't have facts about. But I think going forward, such committee shouldn't be dissolved. It should allow it to be carried out so that at least food information will, will, will be given out to the, to the Ghanaian public for issues of great concern, so that will help deepen democracy and the rule of law. Yeah, employ charge to do that investigation than to allow BNI to go on with the investigation. For better investigation to, to go on, um, my opinion is the MD to step aside for a while. And if the investigation is completed, if he is guilty, then the law will take its course. If it's not, then he cannot as well occupy his position as an MD. You see, there's a middle line that people seem to be lost about it. Minority is doing politics, majority is doing politics with it. The bottom line is, there was a full contamination. Why did this, when did this start? Who was in charge at that time? What has been the normal practice? Those are the series of questions that people have to ask. A minority is asking government to present to parliament the $15 billion agreement with China for approval. Addressing the media, minority leader Harun Idrisu said the deal is an international agreement which must be scrutinized by the legislature. The minority urged government to take a cue from the Supreme Court's ruling on the two Guantanamo Bay detainees and make available the $15 billion agreement it had with China to Parliament. He probably considered that if it was just a mere economic transaction of joint venture, it will not require parliamentary scrutiny. The people of Ghana would want to know full details and particulars 
of any memorandum of understanding signed thereof. On energy, the minority leader said the 15-year bond the government intends to issue was unimaginable. They are using ESLA, the energy sector levy, as collateral receivables for this 15-year bond. What they hitherto describe as a nuisance tax and what they promised to the people of Ghana they will abolish upon the assumption of office. So it means that they are coming to extend the tenor of the new sense. In 2021, the NDC could be forming the next government. Yeah. And we will review such commitments because in our view, there was a sunset clause to the energy sector levy and we did not intend that it should go beyond five years. The group criticized the Bureau of National Investigation for bowing to pressures and acting in a manner that is disrespectful and an affront to the laws of the country in the five million liters contaminated fuel seal by BOST. We are worried and we are concerned as a minority that the Bureau of National Investigation, a respected state intelligence and security agency, should not be reduced this low, and its integrity should not be compromised on the altar of partisan favoritism. The minority said it expects President Akufuado to give credit to the Mahama-led government when he turns on the valve to commence commercial production of oil off Cape Three Points on Thursday. And Minister for Information Mustafa Hamid has said employers should start paying their employees based on the time they spend at work. He stressed that part-time management is the bane to development and if employers start doing that, all sectors of the economy will be productive. Speaking at the launch of Punctuality Ghana, organized by Wisewater Foundation, the minister so advised Ghanaians not to take pride in poor people. time management and appropriate it to Ghana. He said poor time management is not an African phenomenon. One of the fundamental things that we can do to develop is to be time conscious. Why? Because we are either productive or not productive based on time management. He also urged the youth of the country to be ambassadors to push the Punctuality Ghana campaign forward since they are the future leaders. He said the youth should grow up in punctuality so they could be a significant part of all development programs the government is embarking on. Chief Executive Officer of Wisewater Foundation, Emmanuel Amakwe, said Punctuality Ghana has been his brainchild for a long time and now is the opportune time to bring it to light. He said the campaign will not only be done in Accra. Participants at the program express willingness to make use of what they lent. One thing that is common is that the students are really always, they abide by the rules and regulations. So if you emerge it as part of your rules and regulations, I think they will be able to go according to it. Earlier this year, the President of the Republic urged Ghanaians to ensure lateness to functions. Punctuality Ghana is an initiative to synthesize Ghanaians on the need to manage time properly. And now, the 2017 National Science and Maths Quiz ended as an all-boys affair with representation from Kumasi and Accra, though the competition has shocked the sexes over the past 24 years. Female representation to the champions of champions has been a mirage. The idea of the National Maths and Science Quiz was mooted by the chairman of Primetime Media Production House, Kweku Mensa Bonsu, in October 1993. 158 schools across regions, with 27 seeded schools from the previous year's competition, come together for each year's contest. Though the competition has seen successes over the years, Organizers believe using female quiz mistresses for the past 24 years was to make the competition not a preserve of men. What does the current quiz mistress make of the female representation in the competition over the years? If you look at the number of girls' schools that came, it wasn't that bad. The issue I noticed was that um, the did not get past their quarterfinals, and I think they could have done a whole lot better than that. 
In spite of the strategic selection of a female to oversee the quiz, none of the second cycle girls' schools has emerged winner in the champion of champions so far. Year after year, if you look at the Waxi results, you would have the best students, the best performing science students coming from girls' schools. But I tend to think it's a competitive environment that is not very well suited to the personality of the young ladies who show up. What possibly might be the reason for seeing only male schools winning the champion of champions in this dispensation where leaders keep advocating for girl-child education and gender equality? Perhaps there should be some more interventions to boost the performance of female second cycle schools in winning the science and maths competition. We sought the perspectives of some students. They may have notes to write or things to learn about, but because of social media, what's happening and fashion, so they don't have time to learn. But as for the male, although he goes out with his friends, but he has the time to learn with his friends also. They are not giving much morale from their mates in school, like the way you see the guys do. Not that the, the, the female schools don't do well, but they are, their performance is not enough. The initial stages of the quiz see high female participation. However, most are unable to attain the ultimate position. With more quizzes ahead, many look forward to witnessing a girls' school emerge winner and the champion of champions one day. And it is exactly a week today, Premier College were crowned winners of the 2017 National Science and Maths quiz. Congratulations to them once again. It's time for business and Manikia Mensa Brampa will be joining us shortly. All right, thanks for staying with us on Midday Live. Let's do some business now. My name is Manikia Mensah Brampa. Now, the much talked about 3% VAT. This time around, the Importers and Exporters Association of Ghana are speaking, and they have condemned the implementation of the 3% VAT flat rate, which took effect on July 1. The Executive Secretary, Samson Asaki, noted the new rate has caused an increase in the prices of goods and services, putting a financial burden on consumers. The amendment bill was passed by Parliament under a certificate of agency in April and it requires all taxable retailers and wholesalers to account for the value-added tax at a flat rate of 3%. Now, an importer who brings sugar to the country will pay duty plus 17.5% as his input tax. He will now invoice the VAT at 3%. 17.5% when you subtract 3% from it, how much remain? 14.5%. Now this become a cost. Now government is trying to say that they should absorb it. He said the association earlier asked government to reconsider the policy. When they did the simulations, government realized that there's a difference. In the, in the meeting that we sat with the deputy finance, that they can absorb it because when they look at the, the, their cost of doing business and the margins that in, they can absorb it. Samson Asaki says even though government had earlier assured them that the introduction of the new scheme would not affect prices of goods and services, it turns out to be the exact opposite. Government gave that tax relief. They have not even affected it. People have not benefited. Government turned around to come and say that I'm taking another tax called VAT is consumption tax. If they go to the market today and tomorrow and they see prices increase, it's as a result of that difference of 14.5% the government is asking our people to absorb it. They cannot absorb it. They have to push it to the final consumer. He argued the tax scheme also could cause unemployment and increase inflation. If care is not taken, there's going to be a loss of jobs. The wholesaler who used to go and take product from Leicester in the liver, before someone from Abu Sukkan can go and buy, uh, or can go and buy two boxes or three boxes, will now become a, a retailer. He will just buy and sell himself. Now, retailer will have no job to do. All right, so the latest on the matter is that the Finance Committee of Parliament has invited the Finance Minister to further elaborate on exactly what this 3% VAT 
is intended to do, what the minority has described as a 419 VAT rate. So we'll get you the latest on that in our subsequent bulletins. But let's move away from that. And the U.S. Embassy in Ghana says it is working with the Ghana Exim Bank to make available affordable credit to the private sector through the Partnership for Growth program. Now, the U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Robert Jackson, who made this known, said the program also involves efforts to address unreliable and inadequate supply of electricity across the country. The Partnership for Growth is between the United States government and the government of four developing countries, comprising Ghana, El Salvador, the Philippines and Tanzania, to accelerate and sustain broad economic growth of the countries. In the case of Ghana, two factors were identified as key binding constraints to private sector investment and economic growth. They include unreliable and inadequate supply of electricity and lack of access to affordable credit. Going forward, we want to continue that focus to get the Millennium Challenge Compact to the next level to have the concessionaire in place. The U.S. Ambassador to Ghana, Robert Jackson, said the program is working through the Ghana Exim Bank to provide affordable credit to the private sector. Interest rates are coming down, but there's more work to do. And I'm particularly focused and want to hear the government's ideas about how the Export-Import Bank of Ghana can assist exporters to export not only to the United States but to other countries because I think there's huge potential for more trade and export driven growth there. The Ghana-US Partnership for Growth has developed a joint country action plan to help achieve the goals of the partnership before it ends in March next year. And just a quick one on the Forex markets, just before we wrap up on business uh, this afternoon. We've seen the Ghana City depreciate against its major trading currencies. And I will get you the exact figure on News 360 in terms of the depreciation as trading or business is still ongoing. But for the city to the dollar on the interbank markets this afternoon, it is buying at four Ghana cities, 36 pesos, and same when it is being sold to you there on the interbank markets. Remember that these figures would differ from one bank to the other, and definitely the forex figures would be a bit higher than what you see. And for the city to that of the Great British Pound, it is being bought at five Ghana cities, 63 pesos, and it will be sold to you also on the interbank market is five Ghana cities 64 pesos finally city to the euro four Ghana cities 94 pesos and same four Ghana cities 94 pesos that is what you will get it when it's being sold to you there on the interbank markets later in our subsequent bulletins we'll bring you more on business but that will do for now we have sports next and uh Yalfa Sulabi is standing by good afternoon <laughs> Hello, good afternoon. This is still Midday Live. It's now time for sports. My name is Yao Ovosulabi. Let's start from the fi latest FIFA ranking where uh, Ghana has fallen to ninth on the African continent and 50th in the world ranking. And as a result of the two friendly matches they lost uh, against the United States and Mexico, the Black Stars failed to win any of the two games and that has resulted in the slump. Now, Egypt remained the number one team though on the African continent, after, uh, but they dropped four places to 24th in the world. Senegal lie in second place Nigeria have dropped to sixth while Algeria moved five places to Yusef Ghana in eighth place. Germany returned to the summit of the FIFA ranking after their Confederations Cup victory. So as you can see there on your screen, Colombia in eighth place, France with all their talents are in ninth, ninth place, uh, Eden Hazards, Belgium are in tenth place and Poland surprisingly in sixth place there on your screen. Portugal though uh, could not make it to the final of the Confederations Cup but are in fourth place uh, as you can see there on your screen. To our second story now, and Ghana goalkeeper Razak Berma has left Spanish second-tier side Cordoba. The 30-year-old has ended his four-year stay uh, at the club after a frustrating spell last season. Berma refused to extend his contract, which expired last month over lack of assurances he may be guaranteed regular playing opportunities. Now, Berma joined Cordoba two seasons ago from Mirandes, where he was a regular starter. But the Ghanaian struggled for game time last season after making just three appearances for the side. The lack of opportunities might have led to the decision to seek a new challenge elsewhere.
to another Black Stars player and Samuel Safo has made waves after he made his debut for the Black Stars against the United States of America. The man who is a, a constable with the Criminal Investigations Department of the Ghana Police Service says he wishes he will get more playing time with the Black Stars. The hard work still needs to go on. I need to put in a lot of effort to also get a place in, this, in the Black Stars. So I think uh, the responsibility now you know, relies on me. I need to put in much effort. And I was sad anyway, you know, making a debut with a defeat. But then, uh, you know, it's, it's part of life. It's part of the game. You know, sometimes you have to take the defeat to also, you know, bring out the best in you in the next game. So I believe it was a good test for us. Uh, this is the time we need to, you know, up our game because we, we also have some qualifiers to play. So we need to prepare adequately and wait for that particular match. Yeah, we have professional players in the Black Stars. Definitely there will be teams that will come after you. But then you as a player, you need to decide and decide well. You understand? So I think I'm just taking it easy to toe the line. You know, I think, uh, I believe at the right time, you know, better things will follow. Well, as Liberty Professionals captain there, Samuel Safu, dream debut he made for the Black Stars. But Manchester United have agreed a fee of around £75 million with Everton for striker Romelu Lukaku, according to reports. The 24-year-old Belgium international scored 25 Premier League goals last season. United, who have been chasing Lukaku for most of the summer, will not be pursuing their interest in Real Madrid's Alvaro Morata. The move for Lukaku is not connected to talks aimed at taking United forward Wayne Rooney to Everton. Jose Mourinho's side is hopeful of concluding a deal in time for Lukaku to join the squad before they depart for a pre-season tour of the United States on Sunday. Now, Youth and Sports Minister Isaac Isiyama has congratulated the Ghana Arm Wrestling National Team, the Golden Arms, for placing second in the just-ended African Arm Wrestling Championship held in Lagos. The Golden Arms claimed a total of 22 medals to finish second behind host Nigeria at the African Arm Wrestling Championship, winning a silver cup. Golden Arms have thus set a new national record in the total medal haul by any federation at single championships. Nigeria claimed the gold trophy as a top team after hauling a total of 46 medals comprising 19 gold, 16 silver and 1 bronze. Mali finished in third place with a total of 13 medals, 8 gold, 4 silver and 1 bronze. The Youth and Sports Minister was happy with the team's performance and urged the athletes to keep shining despite the difficulties for sponsorship. And they give much more importance to local programming, local content grassroots development. So for almost a year now, they've been able to penetrate the country, bring around the country to search for talents, to hunt for talents. So when you were able to do that, you were able to get the best cream de la cream, get the best to represent this country. We are proud of them and I urge all the federations to emulate this shining example that let us develop ourselves well locally. Charles Osei is president of the Ghana Arm Wrestling Federation. We are happy with, with what we've been able to do, and I think that is going to enhance development. Now, we want to host. Now, once the hosting bit comes in, then we are challenged to expand development to all regions of Ghana. It also enhances infrastructure development because now that we're going to use the sports hall of the Accra Sports Stadium, it means that every patch or every challenge there should be solved. So it is not just developing the sport but it is also improving infrastructure. That's all the sports here on Midday Live. There's more sports news when Thierry Nyan joins you on News 360. My name is Yao Fusilabi. Good afternoon. And over to you, Wendy. Thank you very much indeed, Yao Fusilabi. Now, we have entertainment. Entertainment. On a rather sad note, today, Thursday, July 6, marks exactly three years of the single Castro that destroys mysterious disappearance. This DJ Amis is hopeful of seeing his artist again, adding Castro's absence has robbed him of the prestige that came with managing an A-list musician.
that's why he's a versatile musician. You put him here, he'll do it for you perfectly. And he's a performer who performs, and you love to listen and watch and sing along. He's one guy I have wished everyone would have worked with before. Very respectful, cordial, caring. Castro is believed to have drowned while cruising on a jet ski with female friend Janet Bandu at Adafo. It's been three years of unsuccessful search for the gifted singer. <laughs> For me, I was there. was there. For what the, the person said, no, mm -hmm. and for what I've observed, no, mm -hmm. I can strongly say, say, Anda is no more. Reacting to Asamoajan's recent comments that the high life musician is dead, his manager for 15 years, DJ Ames, said he was shattered by Asamoajan's revelations. What nailed me down was the fact that my boy will never, may not come back again. I went mad. I wept throughout the night and I've not been myself since that uh, interview. I'm praying that God himself will just take control over him and whatever happens, we we'll give it to God. DJ Ames revealed he has never been himself after the incident explaining he's lost the prestige that comes with managing a seasoned musician. Can we talk about what his absence has robbed you of? That robbed me of a lot of things. I knew what Castro have done for me. If not because of him, I wouldn't have even sat in a helicopter and call baby. Castro will make sure always you have something to live with. He has been telling me if you have a very good mind, a peaceful mind, then you, are, you can also suggest something better for him. But today he's not around. According to him, Castro's disappearance has created a vacuum which will be difficult to fill. The industry has lost one of the best songwriter, composer and arranger. And he has featured for almost all the best artists in Ghana today, almost. And, and yeah. he, he certainly felt proud moving with such a talent and he also brought some shine on you as, as a manager. Oh, I was big. DJ Amez, DJ Amez, no, who, who knows me? He made me look like chief in my own palace. Because you, anywhere you go and they tell uh, somebody, this is Castro's manager, even within the country and outside the country, the respect is there. It gives you that kind of hope and confidence in everything that you do. So I also give my heart out to him. Castro again, oh, featuring Baby Jet, Baby Jet. We became what do this be to you. I thank you, I don't be no dear. Well, on that note, we end Midday Live. My name is Wendy Lai. Thanks for watching. Do have a good afternoon.